to present something from Germanische Lloyd Research and Development. You already see the, the, the shape uh, uh, of, of the, uh, let's say, the vision that we put into place. Uh, anyhow, uh, what is uh, the background? I will tell you something about the challenge, why we, uh, as a classification society, uh, starting to develop or make the basic development, the basic construction and design of such a vessel. And uh, so you about the solution itself and uh, telling something about hydrogen as fuel, also the uh, economic approach, what we see right now, also in comparison to uh, normal heavy fuel oil or let's say uh, natural gas, of course. The alternative to, to hydrogen, for instance, right now, if we're talking about gas and less or zero emission, let's say, not in way of CO2, but in way of pollutants, it's, uh, for instance, LNG or natural gas. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis of the whole system at all. And uh, then I fit uh, something like uh, liquid hydrogen or compressed hydrogen. Of course, uh, I'm quite convinced that uh, there is uh, not a fight between these both systems. It's uh, more a dis basic discussion that we have to have uh, about how to store with an, uh, let's say, how to store the energy with hydrogen on board, board on a vessel, or let's say also on trucks or on everything that transports something and is moving. So then, in case of uh, the the size of the uh, the volume itself, if if that counts, then this discussion is very important. And I think uh, liquid uh, hydrogen or liquid uh, natural gas (LNG) this is still in discussion and in shipping. But uh, I think uh, compressed, uh, the shorter the distance with a vessel you have to proceed becomes. The more interesting, uh, like for harbor ferries, uh, compressed gas or compressed hydrogen is. And as been mentioned already, uh, modern cars like Mercedes-Benz, for instance, they run under compressed hydrogen, 700 bar tanks. So this is not, uh, not rocket science. Normally, it's uh, also with this high pressure, it's feasible with general technologies, as far as I know. But anyhow, the dis this discussion and the development, I think it's very important. Yeah, the challenge itself is uh, at least uh, the, uh, let's say, the climate discussion. And what you see in the upper right, this uh, diagram there, this is uh, until, hopefully you can read this, a graph until year 2050 in uh, what we expect uh, increasing uh, CO2 emission from shipping. And there, very much below there, you see uh, this is the demand of, uh, the, let's say, the climate regulators. They say how to keep the temperature be below uh, an increase of 2 degrees Celsius uh, from shipping as well. At least to say uh, shipping, uh, uh, the contribution of shipping to uh, CO2 at all is about worldwide shipping is 2.3 to 3 percent roughly. And you can say in uh, ways of globalization, the uh, transport work that shipping is doing worldwide right now is uh, 90 to 95 percent in way of ton kilometers or ton nautical mile. It depends on what you like more. Uh, next to this, we have the uh, uh, challenge of increasing, uh, let's say, diesel price or let's say energy price in way of... Uh, diesel oil and heavy fuel oil of oil itself, oil-based by, by fuels. And uh, we also calculated, uh, have to take into account, let's say, within the uh, next uh, or the upcoming decade, uh, uh, a CO2 surcharge. This is also discussed by the International Maritime Organization. And uh, they would like to have an emission trading system already <coughs> established here in, uh, in Europe for uh, the aviation industry within last year. 
But anyhow, this is what they would like to establish on uh, shipping as well. On the other hand, not been shown here, it's, uh, let's say, the uh, uh, demand on uh, less emission in way of pollutants. That means CO2, SOx, and uh, not CO2, SOx and NOx already talking about. And we have here in the Baltic Sea and in the North Sea already a sulfur seca area, sulfur emission control area. That means within 2015, we cannot burn in the maritime industry any more uh, heavy fuel oil or residual oil with sulfur contents uh, <coughs> nowadays at 1% or less. Then we go down to 0.1% of sulfur maximum. And that means <coughs> shipping industry have to change over from heavy fuel oil to distillates, frankly speaking. And that means an increase of prices uh, 30, 40, 60 percent. So this is where the background why Germanische Lloyd Research and Development uh, <coughs> said, okay, le let's make a vision about, of course, in my department we also have the uh, gas and fuel cell technology expert of Germanisch Lloyd. And <coughs> so we said together with Future Ship, a daughter company of Germanisch Lloyd, making consultancy in way of ship designs, we making a complete basic new design and based on hydrogen as fuel and fuel cells as well. Uh, a typical, and this is the, the reason why I mentioned this sulfur emission control area here in the northern part of Europe, uh, is a typical uh, vessel, or let's say a typical kind of transport, uh, coast near transportation, is the container feeding. We talked about uh, already about these uh, international harbors like Rotterdam, like Hamburg, Le Rave, what's here in, in, uh, in the UK, I'm not quite sure, is it Felix Dove? It's a large container terminal. But for these terminals, <coughs> Uh, the container will spread all over the northern range, let's say, of Europe. And a typical uh, size of containers vessel, uh, a feeder vessel also going to the Baltic Sea via the, uh, 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 the canal from the Elbe to the Baltic Sea, to Kiel, the Kiel Canal, is 1,000 1, TEU. Uh, And uh, our, uh, yeah, the, the, the finally, the, the next were uh, that the vessel itself, this container vessel, should uh, uh, been, uh, liqu been uh, fueled by liquid hydrogen using the surplus of wind energy from offshore wind farms. Yeah, this is uh, what I mentioned roughly al already. Uh, so we shifted uh, the bridge of this vessel from the aft where normally uh, the engine is. And uh, on top of the engine room, there's normally the, the bridge itself. And we shifted it to the front. Of course, uh, such a large uh, two-stroke main, main engines, diesel engines, we will not have anymore on this vessel. We can, uh, in way of height, we can more uh, have an even distribution of tanks in the uh, engine itself and the fuel cells. Uh, <coughs> 700 TEU with 14 tons. This is a mean weight what we globally have for TEU for containers. And it should be fully open. So it means uh, uh, the bridge in the front has also an advantage in water ingress from rough seas, let's say. And uh, we can speed up uh, harbor operation with, uh, without any lashings, without any hatch covers on the vessel. This was our basic idea. And in, in fact, we have uh, uh, a two-potted propulsors. That means uh, two shuttles or uh, with uh, <coughs> pot, yeah, propulsors at the end of the vessel. So, this were the reason to have a very high maneuverability of the vessel itself so that it can operate also in harbors, uh, nearly all maneuvering without any tack help. Uh, this is the concept as well. And uh, our idea is to have uh, two power generation rooms, as I said, to make it as flat as possible and to distribute it in way of weights also over the lens of the vessel. 
uh, five megawatts uh, or 5,000 kilowatt uh, fuel cell systems uh, and uh, equipped with three megawatt uh, hours battery system. And uh, this battery system is for buffering uh, the, the power coming from the fuel cell system and uh, to cover at least peak power required for maneuvering or in heavy weather condition, for instance. Of course, you know the characteristics of fuel cell is uh, the fuel cells are not very flexible in changing of loads. So it's even better to have them on, uh, on uh, have a flat power output and this is why we have three megawatt uh, hours uh, of battery systems. Uh, yeah, the fuel uh, itself is hydrogen, and we here we're talking about uh, deep cold uh, tank system, so-called Type C tanks, with 920 meter cubed of uh, liquid hydrogen on board. Liquid hydrogen, we're talking about uh, temperatures uh, minus cryogenic fluid, minus 260 degrees, something like this. So it must be uh, in way of safety, we must make sure that in never this kind of fuel will ever reach the steel structure. Of course, then immediately we will we'll have brittle fracture. Then the structure is off. This should give you just an in imagine of uh, how it should look like maybe the year uh, our feeder vessel and uh, to be honest this is not uh, strictly to the physics of course uh, these turbines are too much close together and when you <laughs> when you look there in detail uh, you will also see that the wind comes there uh, from the opposite side than the wind turbines operates but anyhow, this are designer work. This has not been influenced directly from all these navigator architects. Yeah, uh, as been mentioned uh, very roughly, we're talking about surplus from the wind power energy. This was the second basic idea or main driver that we have in our concept, let's say. Uh, and uh, we made rough calculations about that, uh, we're talking about 500 megawatt uh, wind farm that we can produce over a year 10,000 tons of liquid hydrogen. But anyhow, uh, nowadays uh, uh, or recently I've just heard that we also, Germany has a big problem to put this electricity also within the next, uh, let's say, five to ten years been produced in offshore wind parks in the onshore grid. So uh, what to do at least uh, with this energy, with this power? But whether in parallel it's feasible to install, as been uh, shown on the slide before, an offshore uh, fueling station for liquid hydrogen this is, I think, the, the uh, discussion that we would like to push forward. So I think it's, uh, this is not our basic business to talk about this uh, also political decision where we erect, let's say, lighthouses like this. But I think it's uh, at least the numbers uh, are, as far as, we, as I know, correct. And uh, it's feasible. Yeah, talking about costs, this is what I promised. Uh, we also may have some ideas uh, from our uh, sources for what the costs could be. And there you see in dollars uh, per ton liquid hydrogen, a rough number when uh, it's about uh, $4,000 per one ton of liquid hydrogen. This is a number that we took, in taking, uh, took into account with our calculation, with our economic approach for the system at all. Uh, yeah, what does that mean to the price and expected price of energy uh, of uh, heavy fuel or fuel oil and also LNG, natural gas, what does it mean in way of uh, our <coughs> Yeah, energy prices at all. Here you see at the uh, y-axis uh, dollars per million British thermal unit. This energy content unit is, uh, as I have to learn as well, uh, oftentimes instead of megajoule used uh, specifically in the gas industry. And there you see the basic graph. This is uh, 
LNG price, this is the, uh, uh, until May of last year, the, the recent prices. <coughs> the energy price for, or the LNG price in Seebrugge, without distribution, so with that price, you will not have the LNG within the fuel tank of a ship. Frankly speaking, uh, and, but it's, um, uh, it's quite uh, a funny thing that this price is nearly just the energy content, this price what you pay, just the half of heavy fuel oil. And heavy fuel oil, the price is below uh, crude oil. So at least uh, this is one of the uh, things uh, or one of the reasons why the US, for instance, the US uh, truck market goes for LNG right now. So, and uh, I talked to a lot of people also from the US, from Westport, in, in, for instance, they delivering gas technology, and they say, this is the reason for the US going uh, for LNG, of course, energy price. Nothing else counts. And, but you see, uh, when our expectations until 2030 are right, with these price we calculated, it might be feasible with increased MGO prices that we have uh, liquid hydrogen in way of economics uh, feasible for shipping, let's say at 20, 26, 25, roughly like this. So this is, uh, let's say, fr from taking into account the, the numbers uh, been shown before, this is at least uh, the economic truth that, uh, uh, let's say, ship owners or investors will follow. But this is only valid, let's say, for uh, this kind uh, of uh, in, uh, uh, calculation. It might be possible that we see light hot projects in way of ferry industry short or shorter distance shipping. And it's just to give you a more detailed idea, this is the, the energy prices, uh, the same x-axis, the same unit uh, as before, that we are dealing with in the shipping industry. Just to give it, bring it near to you. And uh, you see, uh, <coughs> we have a big peak price, about in million British thermal mm -hmm. unit, about 30 US dollar, it, uh, the, before crisis then the price grew, went dramatically down. And now we have these, let's see, these tripartite uh, between MGO, this means uh, clean fuel in way of diesel, heavy fuel oil and LNG. And, but this is, uh, let's say, also the challenge for a fuel like uh, uh, hydrogen they have to fight with. Yeah, just give you the numbers that we calculated uh, in more details. Uh, installed power in two uh, fuel cell packs is 5,000 or 5 megawatts, let's say. And it gives uh, with uh, the uh, amount of uh, liquid hydrogen of roughly 1,000 meter cubed uh, a range with 15 knots uh, of 10 days. 10 days, this is a normal round trip for a container feeder coming from Hamburg or from Rotterdam going into the Baltic Sea to Finland or anywhere else. This is a typical and fifth, let's frankly speaking, 15 knots for a container feeder nowadays is uh, comparably slow. But also uh, we talked about already about uh, required power for uh, a certain speed for ships. And uh, the disadvantage in shipping is uh, uh, the relationship between the speed of the vessel and the power is uh, the speed raised three, roughly. So that means uh, the slower you go, the more efficient you are. And this is also the reason, maybe you heard about already, that also in global shipping t nowadays, due to this high price of fuel, we're talking about slow steaming. We have nowadays, uh, these days, a lot of vessels and traffic, also in global traffic, they go sometimes with just 10 to down to 6% of their installed propulsion power. So that means, uh, in frankly speaking, this is, was, uh, let's say, five or 10 years ago, this, I'm talking about new container vessels, let's say a, a misinvestment. Of course, uh, these ship, 
could be built much more cheaper, of course. Uh, they are completely overpowered for our operation that we have today. So this is why I mentioned uh, first uh, uh, to have an electric motor on the propeller. It's in way of uh, the overall layout, uh, in energy lay and power layout of a vessel. It's much more better. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, most vessels uh, set into service before crisis or been planned and uh, started to convene, went under construction before crisis, were completely overpowered. So we have a trend to make it, uh, let's say, less propulsion power. And this is what we followed here as well. Of course, this is also valid for, uh, let's say, short sea shipping. Uh, there are other projects that we follow uh, to speed up uh, the harbor operation. So, uh, frankly speaking, our intention is to take into account also for ferry owners of uh, ferry operators, uh, each minute that you save in harbor, you can go slower at, at sea, and this is real money today, real money. But this is just to give you an idea about, and there, yeah, specific energy. Uh, this is also important to compare. Of course, we have specific energy in way of mass ratio to the energy uh, for liquid uh, hydrogen, uh, 120 megajoule per kilogram. To give you an idea, when we compare it to heavy fuel oil or to diesel oil, roughly uh, it's about 40 megajoule per kilogram. So at least that means we have three times more uh, energy content within uh, hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, the disadvantage, the best side of the story is that we also very roughly a ratio of 1 to 10, that means uh, uh, liquid hydrogen has about 80 kilogram per meter cubed, the weight, the mass, and uh, MGO is about 800 uh, kilogram per meter cubed. So at least you see there the difference, the, the content uh, of, uh, of energy is in advantage, but the disadvantage is uh, the, uh, if you compare it to the volume itself. So at least you need three, let's say, more four times more space on a ship to store the same content of energy compared to a, a heavy fuel oil or to diesel oil. It, uh, here, just the important numbers are uh, the investment that we t uh, took into account is about uh, a heavy f uh, liquid uh, or in hydrogen fuel vessel is about 35 million US dollar. And in normal, in general, I'm not quite sure whether uh, been bought uh, in China or here in Western Europe. A uh, uh, thousand TEU container vessel, HFU fueled, it's about uh, 20 to 25 million US dollar, frankly speaking. Within our systems, the investment costs, uh, the type C tanks, so these uh, cryogenic tanks, uh, uh, been able to operate with fuels uh, down to minus 260 degrees Celsius. This is uh, uh, the biggest investment in these kind of vessels. This takes, or uh, you know, the second best, is about 40% of the price. The next is uh, these five megawatt uh, fuel cell system, about 60% of the investment price. And I also uh, were a bit astonished about the battery system uh, is just 6%. So for, for me also, I wondered really whether this is true, but it is. This is our market prices that we're talking about. We have an idea that uh, the fuel cell prices will go down within the next, let's say, uh, one or two decades uh, rapidly, uh, so that we also, with fuel cells production, we go into mass production. There's a good chance, I think. But I think uh, when you have, uh, or ship owners having an idea also go for hydrogen, uh, for zero emission vessels, they have really to follow what is the price development within the next five to 10 years. Uh, at least the number that counts for an investor is the total cost per year. And uh, so for, let's say, a traditional feeder vessel, a traditional or modern feeder vessel going for diesel, 
Uh, <clears throat> of course, in this calculation, calculation, we took into account the diesel price, not the heavy fuel oil price. It's uh, 12, about 12 million US dollar per year compared to roughly 60 million per year. This is the fact what we have right now. And uh, interest rates, let's say 5%, and uh, you see operating days are the same. And uh, annual fuel costs, uh, this is also, you see, nowadays a disadvantage for, for hydrogen, but anyhow, uh, other costs, this is uh, for queuing and so on, but uh, the major uh, cost load for ship owners, for ship operators today, 70% or more is fuel costs. So th this should show you at least, uh, so when, uh, of course, uh, energy pricing is nearly changing each week, each day. Uh, when the, uh, let's say, the, uh, when you operate in these SECA, ECA areas with a, f a feeder, and the price for uh, marine gas oil, marine diesel oil, uh, is near to hit 2,000 US dollar per, per ton, then uh, you are on the, no, this is annual cost, sorry. Uh, but uh, to, to, then you are at the point where this vessel may make economically sense. Environmentally, it will always make sense. But frankly speaking, uh, it's also politically not very easy to compare uh, environmental advantages in way of pollutants, not only in way of CO2, uh, to compare this uh, to, let's say, the costs and whether it makes economically sense or not. I've, as been said before from uh, uh, what we heard about inland waterways in Ita Italy, there is not very much uh, political demand uh, for this kind of, uh, let's say, comparison. And it's also uh, not very feasible politically to do it in this way. Yeah, as been said, to say why we, uh, where this development of MGO, marine gas oil prices, come from, uh, sometimes uh, nobody would like really to remember. In 2000, uh, we paid uh, about $250 per one ton of marine gas oil. And uh, today we pay uh, nearly 1,000. So uh, increasement in price of a factor of four or more. And uh, the highest price ever been seen before crisis for uh, MGO were about 1,320 US dollar per one ton of fuel. So you see, now we are a little bit back to these numbers before uh, uh, or to uh, about thousands, but I think we will never go down again to, uh, to uh, let's say 200 or 250 uh, dollars per one ton of MGO. So it just this is these are uh, it's a different project, but just to give you an idea in relation uh, or how to compare uh, whether we take uh, liquid hydrogen or compressed hydrogen. The other side is how to produce this kind of hydrogen. And this is a new project. It's still confidential from the, uh, of course, this was an, an order that we received uh, beginning of this year to make a concept also for a zero emission ferry connection. And, uh, but this uh, connection is also based uh, basically on surplus of wind energy electricity. But uh, in my department, we took this opportunity also to give us an idea about where the energy, if we would like to go for liquid hydrogen, goes to. And you see the uh, liquefaction takes nearly 40% of the energy itself uh, to deliver liquid hydrogen. Uh, you have here also uh, the transport, 1% uh, in it. Of course, in this project, we thought uh, this, uh, the hydrogen, liquid hydrogen itself, will not be bunkered uh, at the wind park itself. It will be transported to the harbor and bunkered there on the vessel. But, uh, and this is why we also have grid losses, of course, uh, 
5%. It depends on where we are doing uh, the liquefaction. And electrolysis also takes uh, 35%. So the output is uh, what we have, the energy within the liquid hydrogen is just roughly uh, one quarter of the uh, uh, input. Uh, a bit better, uh, it looks like when we go for Gelgenius, uh, so compressed uh, hydrogen, then compression only takes 10% of the energy itself compared to the energy content itself. This is just uh, to give you an idea, of course, uh, but anyhow, there were a reason why we go for, yeah, um, this is the last slide, uh, for liquid hydrogen. Of course, uh, until now, we can't see uh, any kind of hydrogen or compressed hydrogen, the number of tanks or the volume of tanks will be much too large for normal ship concepts until now. Yeah, this is just the conclusion. So uh, I've told this already. As been said, when uh, you can watch the heavy fuel or uh, uh, marine gas oil price, when uh, it be goes quite close to $2,000 US dollar per ton, then we should start this project. Then it makes uh, maybe sense. Yeah, thank you very much. Hope I could give you a brief idea what we, uh, in way of medium-sized vessel, what we're thinking about. But uh, this is really a vision. The intermediate fuel for us is, uh, let's say, LNG. This is what we are going for. But the technology the storing technology uh, is also usable for hydrogen. So thank you very much. Well, there's a lot of information in there, Ron. Right? Yeah, we try to it's push the... Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure there's lots of... Uh, Andreas. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure whether I understood you correctly. The third last slide you had with this energy um, cost I see. And again. Yeah. And so here. Yes. So does it mean that the liquefaction costs more energy than no. the production of the hydrogen by electrolysis? Yeah. Liquefaction is. I acknowledge liquefaction costs about a third of the energy you have in hydrogen, which would be maybe 37% of the 34%. Uh, this, uh, I, I sure we took a put in, for instance, to get this 1,000 megawatt hours of energy. Mm -hmm. We had to put in about 5,000 uh, electricity uh, megawatt hours of electricity, and this is what the, the numbers that we followed uh, from norm, normal technology, electrolysis, and uh, for liquefaction, down to uh, minus 260 degrees. That will mean that the liquefaction always costs more energy than you have energy in the hydrogen. Yeah. That's what you want yeah. to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So this is at least a big disadvantage to put uh, or make the en energy density as high as possible. And this is uh, today we see the only way how to put it into, let's say, normal ship designs. It's really a disadvantage. This is why I made these slides, of course, also to, prom to promote if you need have a shorter distance and you can realize uh, more numbers of bunkering processes or make it uh, make automatic bunkering possible, then you should go for compressed uh, hydrogen. This is what we learned from our project in case of measurement. Obviously, um, you consider using liquid hydrogen to be a large vessel, so I'm going to make the assumption um, that um, in terms of boil off, that wouldn't be too much of an issue. You're consuming it quickly after refueling. Um, have you ever considered uh, cryocompressed hydrogen at all, um, which is the cooling of pressurized gas to, uh, to, um, to use uh, more energy? 
you, you're talking about a combination of. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, tank C types are already uh, designed like this. This is already a combination. Of course, uh, I think when you are not very familiar to these uh, kind of LNG tanks, normal LNG, we have A, B, and C tanks. And C tanks are the type C tanks are the only tanks they uh, can uh, stay higher pressures up to eight to ten bars, and uh, this is one of the reasons.